Hi. My name is Glenn Alexander Thompson, in order that you may see me I have placed a photograph of myself on the bottom left of the screen. Now, because my natural voice is a slow Aussie drawl I am using a much faster computer generated voice for narration. Now, in this video, I am going to demonstrate utter corruption in the justice system of Victoria and particularly in the Victorian Court of Appeal. Amongst other things, I will show that, for criminally corrupt purposes, the court fraudulently fabricates purported orders of the court and fabricates so-called authenticated order documents. Now, while this video is a standalone video, it is best viewed after having seen videos that particularize the background. The opening scene of two of those videos are on the screen now. The one on the left is entitled Protecting Corrupt Victorian Judges, the one on the right is entitled Overtly Corrupt Anti-Corruption Commissioner of Victoria. Links to both videos are provided in the YouTube video description of this video. The first of those videos particularizes the fact that Justice Robert Osborne fraudulently fabricated purported reasons for judgment for the purpose of denying and concealing the overtly corrupt conduct of the now federal court judge, Justice John Middleton. The second of those videos particularizes the fact that while a judge of the Victorian Court of Appeal, Victoria's so-called anti-corruption commissioner, Robert Redlick, fabricated purported reasons for judgment for the purpose of concealing the overtly corrupt conduct of Justice Robert Osborne, and the now Major General Justice Greg Gard. Those videos provide the background to this present video. So, if you have not yet viewed those background videos you may view the first by clicking the link which will shortly appear toward the top right of the screen. Okay, I will now go to the particulars of the overtly corrupt conduct of the Victorian Court of Appeal where it concealed the corrupt judicial conduct of Justice Robert Osborne. On the screen now is a copy of a purported authenticated order document which was authored and uttered under the seal of the Supreme Court of Victoria. A close-up of purported order one of that document is on the screen now. Now, as you can see that purported order consists of two parts, firstly, that the appeal should be dismissed and secondly, that there be judgment for the defendants. Now manifestly, as each and every Victorian judge, magistrate and politician would know. That first part is not an order that something is done and cannot be construed to be an order at all. Manifestly a statement that something should occur does not include that it will, or, will not occur, or, did, or, did not occur. Manifestly no honest and competent judge or magistrate could or would make such a purported order. If a judge or magistrate did make such an order he or she would rightfully be stood down and retired as losing his marbles and being at least a few sandwiches short of an intellectual picnic. Now, that purported authenticated order document squarely represents that, that supposed order was made by Justice Robert Osborne on 29th of November 2006. Now, the fact known to Osborne and, and the court was that no orders at all, other than adjournment orders were made on that day. On that day Osborne merely published purported reasons for judgment and then without making any orders at all he adjourned further hearing until 7th of December 2006. In the comments section of this video, I have included links to Osborne's purported reasons and to the transcript of 29th of November 2006. Inquisitive and diligent judges and magistrates may pause this video and review those documents. Now, a brief outline of the facts and circumstances surrounding the apparent fabrication of that purported authenticated order document are as follows. At a hearing before Justice Osborne, I alleged and evinced that while a mere barrister the by then federal court judge, Justice John Middleton, and the then barrister Major General Greg Gard QC and a number of lesser lawyers had knowingly made false submissions to earlier courts. I specifically alleged that they did not and could not hold a belief as to their respective submissions. Osborne published his purported reasons for judgment on 29th of November 2006 and adjourned further hearing until 7th of December 2006. In the intervening period, I concluded that Osborne's reasons were purposefully fabricated to falsify my allegations in respect of Middleton and Guard and the lesser lawyers. I therefore, prepared a written submission which in no uncertain manner and with particularity alleged that in the face of the facts and the law Osborne had fabricated his purported reasons for judgment and that Osborne did not and could not hold a belief as to the truth of his purported reasons. By that written submission, on 7th of December 2006, I told Osborne that I would appeal his orders. Significantly my written submission also said that the operation of Court of Appeal Practice Note 2 of 1995 would expose the facts of Osborne's fabrications. Now, that Court of Appeal Practice Note No. 2 of 1995 required that Major General Guard and the lesser lawyers prepare a summary of the proceeding in a statement of the facts of the matter, and in this case, it was obvious that they could not do so without exposing the truth of my allegations against Osborne and themselves. Significantly Osborne told Guard and the lesser lawyers that they did not need to reply to my submission. 
The fact, of course, known to Osborne and the lawyers, was that they could not honestly reply. In knowledge of those things Osborne then made his orders on 7th of December 2006. Court of Appeal rules provided that I give notice of appeal within 14 days of the orders appealed from. I filed and served notice of appeal on the last possible day, the 21st of December 2006. My notice of appeal sufficiently alleged that Osborne had fabricated his purported reasons for judgment and that the then barrister, Major General Greg Gard QC, and the lesser lawyers were aware of the fact of that fabrication, and that they were corrupt beneficiaries of those fabrications. Then about five months later, by letter dated 7th of May 2007, Major General Guard's instructing solicitor, Stephen Mark Edwards served me with what he knew well to be a fabricated purported authenticated order document which set out a falsified or fabricated purported order. In that letter Guard's instructing solicitor fraudulently represented that my appeal was invalid because it had been filed out of time from the orders which the in fact fraudulent authenticated order document represented to have been made on 29th of November 2006. I have also provided links to those further documents in the comments section so inquisitive and diligent judges and magistrates may again pause this video and view those further documents. Subsequently, the opposing lawyers who were beneficiaries of Osborne's fabricated purported reasons sought to rely on what they and the court knew to be a falsified order and document to seek to have the Court of Appeal dismiss my appeal. In reply, I simply pointed out the self-evident fact, known to the court and its officers, that no such orders were made on that day or at all. Clearly flummoxed the court adjourned and purported to refer the fabricated orders and document back to Osborne. Predictably, Osborne and the court itself resorted to further overt fraud to conceal the fact of the initial fraudulent order and document. The court and Osborne fabricated the further purported authenticated order document which is on the screen now. That further document falsely and manifestly fraudulently purported to rely on the so-called slip rule to purport to correct the in fact fabricated purported order and the fabricated authenticated order document. Now, the so-called slip rule is a court rule which provides for a judge to correct a legitimate error or omission in an order which had been honestly and legitimately made and which order containing or subject to a legitimate error or slip is accurately recorded in the transcript. The so-called slip rule does not and cannot provide for the correction or deletion of a flagrantly fabricated order which does not exist in any transcript or anywhere else. Nor does it provide for the alteration of a document as was the case in this instance. Now, those further fraudulent orders and documents falsely represented that the in fact fabricated order had been corrected under the slip rule. That further document in fact set out the orders which had in fact been made on 7th of December 2006 and were and remained accurately recorded in the transcript of 7th of December 2006. So the court and Osborne simply tried to conceal fraud with further fraud. The pile of court fraud has become pretty high by this point. That further fabricated authenticated order document was a flagrant and overt act of further fraud by Osborne and the court itself and which further act of fraud was clearly intended by the court and its officers to conceal that the first authenticated order document was an act of overt fraud by the court and its officers. Subsequently, in the Court of Appeal, the six judges who are on the screen now were absolutely aware of the fact of the fabricated orders and fabricated authenticated order documents. They were well aware that that order and document did not and could not arise from either slip or error. Both the order and document were manifestly purposefully created. They were also fixed with knowledge of sufficient prima facie evidence of the truth of my allegations that Osborne had fabricated his purported reasons for judgment. They were also well aware that the sure effect of the fabricated orders was to prevent my allegations from being aired in open court. They were therefore fixed with evidence that there was knowledge of guilt by Osborne and the lawyers. On that point, on a couple of occasions when I went to speak on and air my allegations the judges stopped me from speaking and told me that they had read the papers. Subsequently each and every one of those six judges authored reasons and made orders which were contrived to and did deny and conceal the abundant evidence of corruption known to them. One of those orders was that Associate Justice Lansdowne excused the opposing lawyers from complying with the Court of Appeal Practice Note 2 of 1995. She was sufficiently aware that compliance would at least in part demonstrate the truth of my allegations against Osborne and the lawyers. She was also aware that I had told Osborne that that operation of that rule would expose him. Now, back on to the falsified order and authenticated order document for momentary consideration. That falsified order was prepared five months after I filed my notice of appeal. Manifestly the belated fabrication and uttering, an attempted enforcement of the falsified orders and authenticated order document could only occur as a consequence of a conspiracy between at least Osborne and Edward, and which conspiracy probably included at least Guard. 
Edward did not legitimately request a copy of that falsified order and document, and the court did not provide it to Edward without some form of agreement between at least Osborne and Edward, probably with guard as an intermediary. Manifestly the court, and its officers thought that they could use the awesome power and authority of the court to dupe a mere layperson such as myself into accepting that flagrant fabrication. They were seriously mistaken in that regard. After it became abundantly obvious that the Supreme Court and the Court of Appeal were engaged in common and judicial corruption I made a written submission to the court. In that written submission I said that so long as lawyers of the ilk of guard could lie to the court with impunity then their court was a sham and was not a place to seek justice. I said that truth and fact were far more powerful than their sham court. I then told the court that I had reserved the internet domain name courtzonetrial.com and that I would expose the corruption in their court. I then abandoned my appeal rather than have even more of my money awarded by corrupt courts to criminal lawyers. In full knowledge of the foregoing justices Neve, Mandy, Red Lick and Beach then made costs orders against me and did knowingly award costs to date to the overtly corrupt lawyers. In their reasons for judgment, they each bald-faced lied and said to the effect that I was a nincompoop who made baseless allegations about the conduct of Osborne and the lawyers. I then published particulars of the court fraud on my new website courtzonetrial.com. Then, incredibly, but predictably, the Supreme Court of Victoria embarked on overtly corrupt, probably criminal conduct for the purpose of corruptly censoring the internet. The court and its judges were seeking to conceal the conduct of its courts and judges from the people of Victoria and the rest of the world. In particular, as I will shortly demonstrate, the court and at least several of its judges, overtly corruptly conspired with the court security officer, Gary Ryan to corruptly, probably criminally, intimidate my internet content host to have him remove my website from the internet. Photographs of this Gary Ryan fellow are on the screen now. The photograph on the left sets out the fact that he is the court security officer, responsible for locking doors and closing windows. The photograph on the right shows him posing with a statue of an American gunslinger marshal or sheriff. It appears he didn't pose with a statue of Einstein or Abraham Lincoln. Now it appears that this Gary Ryan fellow is not particularly tech-savvy, it took him a few attempts to master the task of sending an email to my internet content host. On the screen now is a copy of an email which, after a few failed attempts, this Gary Ryan fellow sent to my internet content host. Now, I'm going to read aloud the first substantive line and a half. As you can see this Gary Ryan fellow said, I am writing to you on behalf of a number of Supreme Court justices who are subject to the writings on a website, Courts, on trial, authored by a Mr. Glenn Thompson. Ryan then said that I was engaged in a personal attack on justices and solicitors. Ryan then refers to the barrage of failed emails that he sent. Ryan then asked that my internet content host remove my website from the internet. In that email, Ryan intimidated my internet content host by suggesting or implying that my internet content host would be subject to contempt of court charges for hosting my website. So, as you can see, according to Ryan, he was acting on behalf of a number of Supreme Court justices, perhaps including the immediate past Chief Justice, the supposedly Honorable Justice Marilyn Warren, but almost certainly including Osborne and Guard who by that time had been appointed a Supreme Court judge. So, on the face of it, these poor demented and purportedly maligned Supreme Court judges resorted to criminal intimidation by conspiring with the court bouncer. With great courage. In reply, my internet content host stated the obvious. He said, they are judges, they can get a court order if they wish. I then sent an email to the court bouncer and cc'd that email to the then Attorney General, Martin Pakula. I told them I would publish details of that obviously corrupt conduct on my website, and I demanded that they provide me with the names of the judges who Ryan was purportedly acting for. Predictably neither Ryan nor Pakula provided those names. Then, apparently, the supposed Justice Department thought that that corrupt intimidation was a great idea. The Justice Department and in particular the then Attorney General Robert Clark and his less than honest minion, the Assistant Government Solicitor, Stephen Lee, used identical threats to successfully and overtly corruptly intimidate my Australian internet content host for the purpose of censoring the web and, and sealing corruption from the people of Victoria. They overtly misrepresented fact and law for that corrupt purpose. I simply moved my website to an American web hosting service. Neither the court nor the Attorney General or the Justice Department could get a legitimate court order on the facts so they each resorted to overt fraud and corrupt conduct. My honest and accurate website remains online. Full details are on my website courtzonetrial.com. Now, I will briefly pause my narrative to momentarily directly address the present Chief Justice and the President of the Court of Appeal. Madam Chief Justice and Mr. President, 
I say to each of you that I require you to immediately provide the names of the judges who conspired with the court bouncer to censor the web. I will publish the fact and facts of any response or failure to respond. Okay, back to the narrative. Now, the foregoing court corruption was nothing more than a predictable further link in a continuous chain of court corruption which had its sorted beginning in 1987. I will now provide a brief outline of the matter's precedent. In short, during the period 1979 until 1991, the firm of solicitors, Palmer Stevens and Rennick and officers of the predecessors of Massett and Ranges Shire Council, Caliban Water, Westpac Bank and the ANZ Bank and at least one officer of the Victorian Land Titles Office were engaged in very serious property fraud and corruption. Part of that fraud was in respect of some land which was situated at Kyneton, Victoria and which I had purchased. In April 1982 I discovered one small but serious aspect of that much broader fraud and corruption. Initially I was offered about a million dollars in today's money to sign various documents which would have appeared to legitimize and conceal part of that corruption. I refused and told the offenders that I would report them to the police. I did report the little I knew at that time to the police but the police said the matter was a civil matter. About two weeks later the solicitors and the council and water authority began a chain of what they knew to be overt fraud which was calculated by them to financially cripple me and to prevent the sale of my land to anyone other than a particular timeshare company. In 1985, my then local member of parliament, Mr. Max MacDonald MLA raised the then known aspects in the Victorian parliament. Subsequent to that each of the council and water authority and the predecessor to the ANZ bank repeatedly used overtly corrupt solicitors to literally and repeatedly use the compliant and malleable courts as tools of fraud. The Supreme Court and Court of Appeal proceedings referred to earlier in this video arose as a consequence of the fact that the council and water authority and the ANZ subsidiary conspired with their respective lawyers to use the earlier courts as tools of fraud. Those acts of fraud upon the court were not sophisticated, they didn't need to be, the courts are so compliant and complicit that they do nothing when faced with flagrant and overt acts of fraud. For example, one chain of such fraud on the court was founded on an assertion by the council, and its overtly corrupt lawyers, that in 1982 I was the owner of the whole of the property shown on the screen. At the time of making that representation, the council and its solicitors were well aware that I never was the owner of that property. They were additionally aware that that property ceased to exist when it was subdivided and its certificate of title was cancelled in 1980. Incredibly the gorilla or corrupt Bendigo magistrate, Mr. Connolly SM purported to find that I had purchased that in fact non-existent property in 1980 and that I had sold it in 1983. At the time of uttering that purported finding, the seven plans of subdivision to the right of the screen were in evidence before the magistrate. The magistrate was well aware that I had merely purchased some of the allotments shown on those seven plans. Additionally, at that time witnesses summoned by me had given evidence that they had purchased some of those allotments at the same time as me and that they were the owners of some of the allotments shown on those seven plans. Each of those seven additional plans was plainly marked as having been approved by the Registrar of Titles on 29th of November 1980. Manifestly the magistrate did not and could not hold a reasoned or considered belief or any belief at all as to his purported findings. On the face of it, the magistrate simply regurgitated the fraudulent submissions of the council and its lawyers without knowing or caring if those submissions were true or false. The great possibility, if not probability, is that the magistrate knew well that his purported findings were false. I appealed the orders of the magistrate. At my appeal, Supreme Court Judge William K. found in my favor but did nothing in respect of the fraud upon the court which he had abundant unequivocal evidence of. The fact of the magistrate's preposterous purported finding is recorded in Justice K.'s written reasons. In that magistrate's court proceeding the council fabricated numerous documents and committed numerous instances of flagrant perjury for the purpose of concealing from the courts that each of the seven plans of subdivision was in breach of the law which required a plan of subdivision to show all roads and allotments intended to be set out. The council and its lawyers then repeated that falsification of documents and perjury before Justice William K. and during a subsequent county court proceeding. In addition, at those times the Legal Aid Commission and my lawyers knew well that the council and its lawyers had committed fraud in court, and they each refused to say so and did nothing. Okay, now listen closely for a minute. Because of the importance of this next part, I will speak a little slower. At paragraphs 5 and 6 of his purported reasons for judgment Justice Robert Osborne exactly repeated and represented as fact the essence and substance of the effect of the fabricated documents and the perjury of the counsel in each of the magistrate's court and the appeal before Justice K, and in the subsequent county court proceeding. By repeating that perjury and representing it as fact Osborne maliciously concealed the foundation of my proceeding which was before Osborne. 
That foundation included the fact of the earlier perjury and falsification of documents in the magistrate's court, Supreme Court, and County Court. Osborne derived his paragraphs 5 and 6 from my affidavits which set them out as being the perjurious representations of the counsel. On a simple reading by any competent person those paragraphs are patently false. Those things were also in evidence before Osborne in the documents which Osborne knew to be fabricated for a criminal purpose, namely to conceal that the seven manifestly unlawful plans had been contrived to facilitate and legitimize illegal sales of land which had been made in avoidance of the law by the council's crooked solicitors, Palmer Stevens and Rennick. Now, each and every one of the lawyers shown on the screen now was well aware that Osborne had repeated that earlier perjury and fraudulently represented that perjury as fact. They were also aware that Osborne had fabricated his purported reasons for the express purpose of concealing their individual and collective corrupt conduct. They were also well aware that the entire balance of Osborne's purported reasons were crafted to flow from and provide verisimilitude to his opening misrepresentations. Now each of those lawyers appeared in the Court of Appeal and knowingly and purposefully fraudulently represented Osborne's reasons to be properly concluded. On the face of it there was a wink, wink, and, a nod, nod, going on between the lawyers and the seven Court of Appeal judges. On the face of it, each group was self-assured that the other would not expose their overt corrupt conduct. The same was true and abundantly demonstrated in the earlier courts. Now, I'm going to again speak directly to the present Chief Justice and the President of the Court of Appeal. Madam Chief Justice and Mr. President, over the past 10 years I have repeatedly provided each of you in the immediate past Chief Justice with adequate and readily verifiable particulars of all of the foregoing. I have also provided adequate verifiable particulars of the further aspects which I will now briefly outline. Now, this chain of overt court fraud and concealment of fraud by the courts has been continuous for 33 years. Overt concealment by successive attorneys general has now been continuous for 10 years. During that period there has been 18 separate court proceedings extending over a period of 23 years and having innumerable, probably 60 or more, separate principal and interlocutory court hearings. Each and every one of those 60 or more hearings was characterized by overtly fraudulent conduct by the lawyers for the Massett and Ranges Shire Council, Caliban Water and an ANZ Bank subsidiary. Including by the now Major General Justice Greg Gard. One of those hearings was particularly characterized by the fact that, while a mere barrister, the now federal court judge, Justice John Middleton, brought an overtly fraudulently fabricated case to court. That particular hearing was further characterized by the fact that at the time that Middleton was putting his flagrantly fabricated case to the Supreme Court each of Associate Justice F. Thim and the six lawyers who are on the screen now knew well that Middleton was bald face lying to the court. Not surprisingly the six lawyers did nothing because they had an overtly fabricated reply to Middleton. The key point being that Associate Justice F. Thim was absolutely aware that Middleton was flagrantly lying to the court, and he did nothing. That particular hearing was further characterized by the fact that while a mere barrister, the now Major General Justice Greg Gard and his instructing solicitor, Stephen Mark Edward fabricated a document and Edward swore a false affidavit to legitimize production of that fabricated document. That hearing was further characterized by the fact that my solicitors had personal knowledge that Edward's affidavit was false and they refused my request that they tell the court of their personal knowledge. The exact words of my solicitors were, The court does not want to hear about that sort of thing. That continuous chain of corrupt and fraudulent conduct is sufficient to establish abundant evidence that the justice system of Victoria and particularly the Victorian courts are at least substantially corrupt and that corruption is systemic and endemic. Now, Madam Chief Justice and Mr. President, the last occasion on which I provided each of you with adequate evidence of these things was on the 12th of February 2019 when I provided each of you with a link to the YouTube video which is on the screen now. With sufficient verifiable particularity that video set out the details of all of the foregoing plus a bit more. Now, as you can see YouTube has blocked that video to Australian viewers. Overseas people can view it but Australians cannot. Now, as you can see YouTube blocked that video because of a purported legal complaint from the government. The simple fact is that there was no legitimate legal reason and certainly no court order to censor the web. Manifestly, at least one corrupt individual with sufficient authority lied to YouTube to once again censor the web and conceal the court corruption. I have no idea who actually lied to YouTube but each of you or some other judicial system officer is a possibility. Perhaps YouTube was provided with yet another fraudulently fabricated authenticated order and document. I chose not to appeal to YouTube. Having that censorship remain in place is a powerful testament to the level and extent of judicial system corruption that I have been faced with. 
To counter that further corrupt censorship I merely produced a new copy of that video and prefaced it with particulars of the censorship. The opening scene of that new video is on the screen now. A link to that new video is provided in the comments section of this video. Now, Madam Chief Justice and Mr. President it appears to me that there are only two possibilities. Either each of you and the other denizens of your supposed justice system averts your eyes and remain willfully ignorant of the fact of the pervasive and flagrant corruption in your courts or you are well aware and choose to be a party to the concealment and perpetuation of that overt corruption. In either case, it appears to me, that your conduct is indistinguishable from the various priests and others that averted their eyes and or actively concealed pedophilia. In my view, you each have no option other than to use your inherent powers to initiate an inquiry into these things which have affected me and my family. You should have that inquiry then review the conduct of the courts generally with a view to reforming a system that permits and encourages the gross fraud and corruption which does occur in your courts. Certainly, it will be painful. The almost certainty is that there are many thousands of instances of judicial and court corruption which will be uncovered. However, that certain pain is a product of the present pervasive sycophantic culture of the Victorian justice system where no one has either the courage or integrity to stand against lawyers of the ilk of Middleton, Gard and Osborne, and the others named in this video. That culture must be exposed and excised so as to as far as possible ensure that future courts are conducted honestly. After having established such inquiry both of you should resign. The inherently corrupt culture which exists in your justice system extends to government and corporate Australia. Of particular note is that in this instance the directors and executive of the ANZ Bank, including Mr. David Gonski, AC, were provided with abundant evidence of the role of their subsidiary and their solicitor in these matters. They were provided with ineluctable evidence that in 1988, with the knowledge and consent of the executive of their subsidiary their solicitor, Mr. John Norman Price purposefully conspired with the then junior barrister Greg Gard to overtly deceive the then Victorian Administrative Appeals Tribunal. That evidence strongly indicated that Justice Robert Osborne had particularly fabricated his purported reasons to conceal my allegations of that particular 1988 instance of overt corrupt conduct by Greg Gard. With sufficient knowledge of those things and with knowledge of evidence that the conduct of their subsidiary and their solicitor and guard and Osborne had led directly to my impecuniosity the ANZ bank proceeded to force the sale of my family home. The ANZ solicitor acting in that forced sale was the Queensland solicitor, Miss Susan Forrest of Gaddon Solicitors. At that time of so acting Miss Forrest was also well aware of sufficient of the foregoing and she also chose to remain silent in respect of clear evidence of corrupt and criminal conduct leading to the forced sale of my family home. In my view, Donsky and Forrest epitomize the corrupt culture which encourages corruption in the courts and elsewhere. No one has the courage or integrity to stand up. Okay, now I'm going to directly address the Chief Magistrate of Victoria. Madam Chief Magistrate, the unfortunate but predictable fact is that at least some of your courts are also conducted in such a manner as to enable crooked statutory authorities and their crooked lawyers to use complicit and compliant courts as tools of fraud. I have already referred to one instance which occurred way back in 1987. Now, immediately after I abandoned my appeal to the Court of Appeal the Macedon Ranges Shire Council and its predictable bevy of corrupt lawyers engaged in a further flagrant instance of using your compliant and malleable courts as tools of fraud. Full particulars, including court-recorded audio, are now set out in the video which I have produced and will refer to shortly. Now, as abundantly particularized in that video, the barrister Richard A. Harris and the solicitor Catherine Stiles, and the CEO of Macedon Ranges Shire Council, Peter Johnson, conspired with one another to fraudulently fabricate documents and make overtly false submissions for the purpose of using the magistrate's court as a tool of fraud. In that proceeding a witness for the council was the council's senior rates officer. Ms. Lisa Kennedy. Now, the evidence given by Lisa Kennedy was flagrantly false and could not be concluded from the documents evinced and referred to by her however I formed the view that Lisa Kennedy was coached by Harris Stiles and Johnson and she had no understanding of the absurdity or implications of her sworn evidence. Now, that hearing was conducted before Magistrate Bernard Fitzgerald. Now I don't have a photograph of Magistrate Fitzgerald or the earlier Magistrate, Mr. Connolly SM however I think that the caricatures on the screen are a reasonable representation of both. Now, as the video abundantly demonstrates, during the conduct of the proceeding and in his purported reasons for decision the magistrate, Mr. Bernard Fitzgerald simply regurgitated or parroted the palpably false and impossible in fact and law things set out in the fabricated documents and false submissions put to him. It is manifest that Magistrate Bernard Fitzgerald did not and could not hold a reasoned or considered belief as to his purported reasons. 
As with Connolly SM Magistrate Bernard Fitzgerald simply parroted the garbage very purposefully put to him by corrupt lawyers who use the clearly compliant courts as tools of fraud. Significantly, as with all of the material I have referred to, the overtly corrupt lawyers fearlessly prepare their fabricated cases not knowing or caring which judge or magistrate may hear their fabrications, and not knowing or caring which barristers or solicitors may be engaged to oppose them. The corrupt lawyers are simply self-assured that no one has either the courage or integrity to expose them. Okay, now Madam Chief Magistrate, the opening scene of that video is on the screen now. As you can see the title to that video is Macedon Ranges Shire Council, 40 Years of Property and Rate Fraud. Now, in that video, I personally provide the narration so it is a little long and my voice is boring however it is what it is. In addition that video was not intended for your consumption, it was directed at the Macedon Ranges Shire Council and CEO and sets out some of the matters precedent to the fraud upon the court which I am discussing in this video. However, that video does squarely and abundantly and very accurately exposes a complete example of a crooked statutory authority and crooked lawyers using your courts as tools of fraud. You have a duty to personally watch it. A link to that video is in the comments section of this video. As you will see, the supposed hearing in your court was not a court proceeding, the entire charade was a calculated act of fraud in and upon the court, and that fraud was aided and abetted by the predictably compliant and malleable magistrate. My expectation is that you will do whatever is necessary to prosecute the individuals involved. I also expect you to initiate inquiry and reform to put an end to the flagrant corruption in your courts. Perhaps you should suspend all forthcoming proceedings until that task is complete. Finally, just to complete the picture, I'm going to make two further important points. Firstly, over the past 10 years, I have also repeatedly referred aspects of these things to the 1,900 or so Victorian barristers who have a published email address. Most said nothing. Some of them replied with abuse and threats of legal violence. Particulars, including a list of names of those 1,900 barristers, are on my website. Not one of them was prepared to stand against the corruption adequately evinced to them. My bet is that at least half of them would be out of work if they were prevented from bringing tenuous or baseless, if not fraudulent cases to court. The additional likelihood is that half the judges and magistrates would be left twiddling their thumbs. Now, the second point is that at the time that Justice John Middleton was appointed a federal court judge at least the six lawyers who appeared before Osborne, and Associate Justice F. Team were well aware that Middleton had put a flagrantly false case founded on flat-out lies to the court of Associate Justice F. Team. It follows that at least F. Team and the six lawyers were well aware that Middleton was not a fit and proper person to be appointed a federal court judge. Notably, Middleton had already been appointed a judge by the time of the hearing before Osborne so the fact was that at that time Osborne fabricated his reasons to protect a brother judge. The same is true of Gard. It was well known that Gard overtly deceived a tribunal back in 1988, and at least the five other lawyers and Osborne was aware that Osborne had fabricated his orders to conceal that fact. In addition Gard and Edward fabricated a document used in the hearing before F. Team and Osborne. It follows that at least some lawyers and Osborne knew well that Gard was not a fit and proper person to be appointed a Supreme Court judge. Both Middleton and Gard received sickening, sycophantic, fawning, praise upon appointment. Okay, that's all. Okay. Now, back to my natural voice for a final comment. 2,400 years ago, the great philosopher Plato postulated to the effect that if people with a criminal predilection are provided with assured safety, then they will be criminals. Plato also postulated that the most perfect injustice is done by those with the greatest reputation for justice. It is now obvious that the reputation of the ecclesiastic environment provided cocoons of safety for pedophiles. It appears to me that the reputation of the bar and the bench provides a cocoon of safety where injustice is assured. The bar and the bench must acknowledge the statistical certainty that at least some of its denizens have a less than honest, perhaps criminal, predilection. That will be the first and most important step in reforming a presently inherently corrupt cocoon of safety where the class of extreme corruption serially experienced by me is assured. The End